how can we know whether a simultaneous equations model is identified? There are a couple of different techniques for figuring out. The set of techniques that I'm talking about applies to our covariance structure models. In these models, all relationships are linear. So th there are no interactions, no exponential relationships, no U-shapes, and also all observations are independent. And if these two uh, assumptions hold, then uh, we can establish identification by looking at the population covariance matrix. And also the model can be identified, identified by looking at the sample covariance matrix because that provides uh, all the information that we need for identification. Of course, if we are interested in means, then we also need the mean vector. But this is about uh, covariances because that is uh, sufficient for understanding the basics. So the, the principle of identification is that we can um, we need to be able to solve for unique values for each parameter from the population matrix. And uh, there are two different ways of demonstrating that this can be done. The first is the algebraic method where you actually go and you solve from the population covariance matrix uh, to the, uh, the model parameters. And you don't of course know what the values of the population covariance matrices are but you just uh, use use the information about the covariances or this is like a symbolic math instead of calculating numbers. I'll show you an example on, on a couple of slides. So this is, a, this is one way but it gets a bit tedious if your model is large, if you have a large number of parameters and it's also can be very challenging to do if the model contains feedback loops. Another approach for establishing identification is to apply certain rules. So there are certain classes of models or models with certain features that have been shown to be always identified or always non-identified. And applying these rules is a lot more practical solution for establishing identification. Sometimes we don't know about the identification and we don't have rules, then uh, proving part of the identification problem can be useful. And um, there are also a, there's also a third way of doing it, the empirical strategy, which I'll talk about at the end of this video. My example comes from, uh, from a book by Paxton and co-authors. I think this is the best source on uh, mathematical identification of covariance structure models. So they have a chapter on identification and they talk about uh, recursive and non-recursive models. They provide examples and it's, uh, it has some math but it's fairly readable if you understand covariance algebra. If you don't, then understanding the identification uh, techniques is going to be difficult anyway. So let's go to our example. So we want to prove identification of this model. Our model is a full mediation model x influences m which influences y and there is no endogeneity so that the error terms are uncorrelated. So we, we know based on the rule that all recursive models are identified that they should be identified but we can also prove it and that it's not uh, that difficult to do. How we proceed with uh, proving that this is identified is that we first express these variances and covariances in the sample as functions of these, these model parameters that we are estimating that we don't know. So this is the information that we know from the sample and this is the information that we need to estimate. These are the parameters that we need to estimate. So we need to understand if the estimation problem is even principle possible to solve. So we'll start by writing the easy easy part so the variance of x is simply the variance of x it doesn't depend on the model because x is exogenous. Then the variance of m is, is beta x square times variance of x plus this variance of this error term here and the variance of y is calculated the same way. We could of course express the variance of y as a function of variance of x and variance of this error term here and that error term there but uh, it's a lot simpler to uh, express it as a function of variance of m which we know from the, from the population or we would know if we had the data. Then the covariance is covariance between x and m is simply a uh, variance of x times beta x covariance x to y times where we, we take the variance of x we multiply by beta x we multiply by beta m and that gives us the covariance between x and y. So we multiply two paths and the original variance and uh, this covariance with m and y is calculated the same way. So now we have the vari this set of equations based on tracing rules and then we start to solve for these unknown parameters using these equations. And uh, high school math tells us that this is an uh, overdetermined system because we have six equations with five unknowns 
and the high school math also tells us that, that there may not be a solution for this. But um, that's a topic of, of another video. We can, we can start solving uh, this uh, equation. So let's start by looking at the regression coefficients first. So we can solve for beta x using this first equation here. We can solve for beta m, for example, using the third equation here. We can solve for variance of x. Uh, well, it does not need to be solved. It's here. It's just a sample variance. We can solve for the, bar, uh, for the error term of u using this fifth equation here and uh, the information about beta x2 that we have solved before. So the idea of, of uh, showing that or the identification using this technique is that uh, after you have shown that one of the parameters has been identified, like we identified this beta x first, then we can use that identified parameter to show that another parameter is identified. So here we have beta x square, square can be used here because we have identified it before. And the variance of, of y, uy is, is uh, calculated the same way. So we were able to solve all these parameters from these covariances, variances and covariances. And uh, we also noticed that there is this one covariance that we use. So what about this? How, what do we uh, do with this covariance? So we had excess information. So this gives us one degree of freedom. So we had one excess unit of information. We had one covariance that was not required for estimating in the model. What we can use this covariance for is to solve for uh, this coefficient beta m because it contains beta m in a different way. We could also solve for beta x. It doesn't matter which one we solve. If we have decrease of freedom excess of uh, zero or positive decrease of freedom, then it means that at least one of the model parameters can be solved in at least two different ways. So we have two different ways of, of solving for beta m and um, let's write them here. So we have beta m equals covariance xy divided by covariance xm and uh, covariance my divided by variance of m. So uh, we can actually use this for testing the model. So, so we can write that these two are equal or we can write that they are, uh, their difference is zero. And, and the, the latter way is, is the most useful way. So we can calculate if covariance xy divided by xm minus covariance my divided by variance of m is actually zero. We can calculate this quantity and then we can compare that against the... Uh, we can calculate this from the data and then compare it against zero. If our calculation here does not equal zero in the population, then it means that the model is misspecified. So uh, in a misspecified model, solving uh, for, two para for, for one parameter using two different ways would lead to two different solutions. Then we know that the model is not correct for the data. In small samples, uh, this, will, uh, this difference will never be exactly zero. And uh, we would use that information and we would ask the question of, whether that difference from zero can be attributed to chance only. And this is just one constraint. So we have one degree of freedom and we would be testing that covariance constraint using the chi-square test with one degree of freedom. If we have more than one of these uh, constraints, things that can be solved in multiple different ways, then we will use the chi-square with more degrees of freedom. Like if we have three uh, different tests, we use chi-square distribution of three, with three degrees of freedom for testing if those uh, constraints hold in the, in the population. So in practice, this is, um, this is not a practical solution for uh, establishing identification in practice. But there are a couple of uh, good rules of thumb and heuristics. First, if your degrees of freedom is negative, then the model is going to be unidentified no matter what. Some part of the model can be identified, but generally uh, estimating models with negative degrees of freedom is not a good idea because um, at, at least the beginner would not have an easy way of knowing which parameters are identified and which are not. Recursive models are always identified. That's a good thing to know. So if there are no feedback loops, no correlations between the error terms, then the model will be always identified. And there are various heuristics that can be applied that are explained, about, explained in another video that apply to non-recursive uh, models and particularly rank and order conditions are something that many books on structural equation modeling explain. There are also empirical checks. So uh, 
it may be po possible to establish identification, but in, in some scenarios you might not be sure if your model is identified. And uh, this identification is something that you generally should check before data collection, because if you collect data and then you realize that your model that you wanted to estimate is not identified, then our estimation with that data or any other data would be futile. So that's uh, like worthless exercise. So how do you know that the model is under identified or non-identified based on uh, empirical checks? First, some statistical software uh, provide you checks. So there are checks programmed into software. Uh, for example, M plus does a pretty good job at telling you whether the, when the model is identified or not, and also pointing out which parameter it thinks is not identified. So if your software gives you warnings, you should pay attention. Another indication of non-identification is missing or extremely large standard errors. Sometimes confidence intervals can be missing or, but uh, if your results look really weird, that is an indication of non-identification. It can be also an indication of some other problems. So when you have a weird result, then you need to start doing diagnostics and to understand what's going on. Establishing identification is, is uh, one of the first things that you should, you should check if your uh, estimation does not seem to go through smoothly. And then there are empirical checks and uh, you can try estimating the model with different starting values. So the estimation of these models is an iterative procedure. So the computer guesses some starting values typically are using some kind of instrumental variable technique and then it, then it starts to optimize those starting values to uh, make the model fit better. And you can also try your own starting values. If two different starting values lead you to two different solutions for the model parameters, then uh, the model is not identified, at least this, in this class of models. There are other classes of models where uh, there may be scenarios where uh, two different set of starting values uh, converge to the two different solutions, but that would not immediately imply identification problem. So identification problem in this class of models can be easily checked by running the model with different starting values. If you choose five different sets and you always get to the same estimates, then uh, you can be pretty well guaranteed that uh, pretty certain that the uh, model is actually uh, identified. Then you can re-estimate the model with, with the model implied covariance matrix. So you can ask the computer to generate the covariance matrix that is implied by the model and estimate it again. If you get the same result, then that is uh, an indication that the model may be identified. If you get a different result, then for sure the model is not identified. Final strategy is to re-estimate the model with simulated data. And this is a, a good strategy because you actually don't need to have the data at hand. So this can be done before data collection. So if you're not sure about uh, whether the model is identified or not, generate the data set from a, a large sample like 100,000 observations or a million observations, something like that, where you know that your model holds, then estimate the, uh, the model. If you get the correct estimates, then the model probably is identified. If not, then the model is not identified for sure. Sometimes generating data from the correct model may be difficult because generating random numbers for, for example, models with feedback loop is challenging. In that case, you can just generate any data, any correlated data, and then apply this estimate model with different starting value strategy. So these are some empirical strategies for establishing identification. Let's take a look at a non-identified model and uh, what it looks like in a statistical software. So this is data and uh, we are estimating a structural ecosystem model with SCM command. We have uh, two variables x and y and we are estimating the effect of x on y and y on x. That of course is not identified because we have just one covariance and we are trying to estimate two relationships between variables. You cannot estimate two things from one thing but nevertheless data provides us estimates. So um, the problem with data here is that data does not do a good job in warning about identification problems. If you were to estimate this same uh, model with Lavan in R or M plus, you would get a warning that the model is not identified. Data does not give you that unfortunately. But there are a couple of signs that we can look at that tell us that this is actually a really problematic analysis that we shouldn't trust at all. First of all, the negative increase of freedom. So we have chi-square with minus one decrease of freedom. Of course, that can be calculated because it's not defined, but that already indicates that this model has serious problems. There are two other indications. One is that the standard errors are very large here. 
So that means the computer tells that, that there's, there's great uncertainty about estimates. And uh, that's a bit of an understatement because we don't know about the, uh, the correct estimates at all, given that the model is not identified. And the final thing that is the easiest to, to spot is that the confidence intervals are missing here. So sometimes standard errors are missing, sometimes confidence intervals are missing. And um, now the problem, of course, is that uh, if we have a researcher who has heard about uh, the fact that structural equation model can be used to estimate these two directional relationships and a researcher does not understand much about identification, this model still gives the results that the researcher is looking at. So typically we want to know uh, the, uh, the p-values for, uh, for the structural paths x, y, y, x and we get those p-values. So we would say that they are non-significant, they are not related, but that would be an incorrect conclusion because these x and y are actually related because they, they are actually highly correlated in the data. But it is very easy to, uh, to, uh, to overlook these identification issues and uh, because of that you need to pay attention to uh, the decrease of freedom, you need to pay attention to missing results even if you're not using them and you need to pay attention to uh, standard errors even if uh, you were looking at the p-values eventually.